Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 5th of February and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 8th of February. Um, it's certainly been an interesting week, contrasting from the Reddit inspired retail sell off of last week and by and large markets appear to have recovered some or most of their equilibrium after the big sell off that we saw at the end of the previous week. So as we come into the second month of 2021, I think the big question here is whether or not we re revisit or see new record highs on the S&P 500, the DAX, and um, similar sort of stabilization after what has been, I would, I would suggest is a fairly mixed start 2021. Um, it was a quick sort of recap. Um, we started the started the year on a fairly good note, fairly positive note. We then spent the rest of January sort of giving most of those gains back. And obviously we've seen the GameStop um, inspired sell-off, which now appears to have subsided. US markets extended their rebound um, this week for the fourth day in a row, yesterday on Thursday. And it would appear that the recent fallout from the Reddit GameStop inspired sell-off has continued to fade. We started the week with silver pushing up towards $30 an ounce. Those gains have since pretty much evaporated. And I think what's taken over this week is once again the topic of economic fundamentals, particularly US economic fundamentals. And we can see, particularly in the way that the US 10 year Treasury yield has behaved over the past few days, that bond markets are starting to price, certainly starting to price in a fairly decent economic recovery. Um, we had the Bank of England this week. Um, they pretty much took negative rates off the table. In fact, that's the way I read it. I mean, obviously, they were careful not to do it completely. But ultimately, my scepticism over negative rates thus far does appear to have panned out. And I think it's going to take something really, um, something really bad, a black swan type event for us to get negative rates later this year, um, simply because the direction of travel when it comes to the vaccine rollout plan is by and large fairly positive. And one thing that I have noted um, this week is the way that, um, well, not just this week, over the course of the past few weeks and months is how the move higher in US 10 year treasury yields has mirrored the decline in the gold price over the same period of time. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that we've got Obviously, the lows in the US 10 year around about 0.51% and now 1.14. If we look at the gold price, let me just pull that off, bring up the gold price there. We can see from the peaks in early August, which is around about the lows of where the 10 year treasury was, we're pretty much back down, pretty much back down there again in terms of US gold prices. And we can see that with this chart here. Similar sort of peak in the gold prices coincides with a low in US Treasury. So I would suggest if we get a move higher through 120 in the US 10 year yield, then we could well see gold push back below that 1763 area that we saw um, all the way back in November there. So there's, there's definitely something going on there between gold and US 10 year treasuries. And it's not hard to see why as, tre as treasury yields what as treasury yields rise the attraction of owning gold diminishes um but that, that's by the by let's look at what equity markets have done thus far this week and basically FTSE 100 has been the ugly sister of um equity markets this week it's really really struggled um to really um make any sort of significant rebound relative to its peers and a large part of that is obviously disappointment over earnings from the likes of Royal Dutch Shell, BP and Unilever. They make up a significant chunk 
of the market capitalization of the FTSE 100. That being said, um, you know, my case for the FTSE 100 remaining fairly well supported still remains intact. We remained above these lows that we saw back in December, bottomed out around about 6,300. And while also the performance of the pound is likely to act as a bit of a drag on the FTSE, I don't really expect that to prevent a move back towards these highs that we saw all the way back in the early part of January. Ultimately, for me, the direction of travel is everything. Um, regular listeners of these videos will know that I'm very much momentum driven, trend driven, higher lows, higher highs, um, lower highs, lower lows. So it's all about what the peaks and troughs are doing for me. And yes, it's disappointing that we've broken below the 50 day moving average, but we're still above the 200 day moving average. We need to get back above that 50 day moving average to stabilize a little bit. And what I might do here is I might put a nice little trend line in there just to signal um, a little bit of a resistance level, which also happens to coincide with the 50 day moving average. So that level is particularly important in the overall, um, in the in terms of the overall direction travel. The DAX is revisiting those peaks that we saw um, in the middle of December. Um, if we look at this this chart here, we can see that there. Or beginning of January rather. So basically, unlike the FTSE, the DAX is looking as if it could well make new record highs over the course of the next few sessions. The big level for me is 14,134. We're only about 40 points away from that right now. If we look at today's peaks, um, it's pretty much yeah, 14,114. So that's a big level, this level here. Um, but what was important was this dip here did not take out the previous lows here. So again, momentum is very much skewed towards the upside. The trend is, you know, a trend, the trend is in effect until such times as there's evidence that it is turned around. Similar sort of story with the S&P 500. I talked about this last week. Again, we managed to hold above this trend line here. 50 day moving average acted as a little bit of a support level, but as we can see from previous instances, it generally doesn't tend to stray too far away from it. And in terms of confirmation, what we want to see when we break this 50 day moving average is obviously the break of a previous low, which we did not see. So again, it's about the momentum. Price action trumps everything, even moving averages and oscillators. They're my primary indicators, price, price, um, price action. Previous highs and previous lows are much more important than, than breaks in moving averages and oscillators and what have you. These are secondary indicators which should be used to supplement your trading, um, your, 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 your trading plan. Um, markets in Asia, um, sorry, select, select the Nikkei, not the, not the deck. The, the, the Nikkei is closed at its highest level, best weekly close in over 30 years. And as we can see from the big declines that we saw here, ordinarily that would have been a potentially bearish reversal. It's been completely reversed in the space of a week. And this is why bearish reversals generally need to be confirmed. And in which case, even though it was a key reversal day and we came back down here, what was what was interesting with respect to this particular move lower was that we didn't take out these previous highs through here. Um, and that was a little bit of a warning sign. You know, with the Japanese candlesticks or key reversal days, sometimes what you need to see more than anything else is not just the signal itself. You need to see a confirmation of the signal. And we did not see that. Um, so those twin peaks um, at the end of December and January, around about 27,000, um, acted as a fairly decent support area on the Nikkei 225. And as a result, um, that move failed. So certainly keeping an eye on the Nikkei 225 and generally reversal patterns, they tend to be less reliable now these days simply on the basis of the fact that um, central bank money drives markets so much now 
that it's very, very dangerous to try and pick tops, particularly in central bank controlled indices of which the foot of which the Nikkei is very much front and center, given how much the Bank of Japan owns the market. So Nikkei 225 still looking positive, S&P 500 still looking positive and actually has made new record highs this week. So very much a case of the trend is your friend. So um, what's to be expected for the week ahead? Well, it's been a decent week for the US dollar and we've got non-farm payrolls later today. Obviously, I don't have visibility of those numbers, but all the signs point to a positive payrolls report. Um, the December report was disappointing. And those of you who are listening to my webcast um, will know that um, I wasn't unduly surprised by the fact that the number was poor. It was pretty much well trailed in some of the data leading up to it. Um, ISMs, the employment components, the weekly jobless claims, the rises there. And obviously the negative print in the ADP report two days before. Now, we've seen similar sort of signs for this week's payrolls report, positive ADP report coming in much better than expected. We've also got a new stimulus plan, which was passed at the end of last year of $900 billion with the prospect of another one on top of that. And the January ADP report saw 174,000 jobs added, more than reversing the 78,000 jobs that we lost in December. And that is a very positive revision because the previous, the initial um, December report was minus 140. So the fact to see it was revised up to minus 78 was very much a positive sign. So expectations around today's jobs report are for a, re for a number in the region of between 100 and 200,000. So anything less than 100,000 is likely to be a disappointment. But on the other hand, if it is below 100,000, then obviously the onus will be much more on Capitol Hill politicians to pass another stimulus plan by the beginning of March, which as it goes, isn't that far away, given the fact that we've only got 28 days in February. Anyway, so looking for a fairly positive ADP payrolls report, I'm sorry, non-farm payrolls report, all of the economic data that we've seen thus far this week has pointed very much to a um, fairly decent um, US jobs report. So it'll be it'll be a disappointment if we don't get that. So looking at the CMC dollar index, we've seen the dollar index make a two, three month high. Um, the CMC dollar index hasn't taken out these peaks here. And as a result, it's starting to pull back a little bit. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't look as if it's starting to form a little bit of a basing pattern. We've broken this trend line here. The next key level is likely to be this peak here, which is around about 963. So that 963 level could be the catalyst for further gains higher. I think myself that we should see the dollar move higher. And I will explain my reasons for that um, when we look at euro dollar. Now, last week, I talked about euro dollar and I talked about the 12070, the 12040 area. Those of you who recall that. And I suggested at the time that if we broke below 12040, then it was quite likely we would move quite a bit lower. Well, look, there we go. And I also talked about the potential for a head and shoulders reversal. Now, it's not your textbook head and shoulders reversal, simply because we've got two left shoulders, a head and a single right shoulder. But nonetheless, by virtue of doing some Fibonacci price extensions, I'm going to plot my breakout here from this level here through here. And for me, this breakout is significant in the context of where we go next with respect to euro dollar, because I think we will probably see a move back to 117 and 60, which would be a measured move of this move here between the highs and the breakout down to here. This is generally how I measure my price objectives on, say, for example, a head and shoulders breakout, a triangle breakout, 
or any pattern formation breakout. You measure the height of the pattern, which is this here, from the breakout point, which is here, 12050, takes us down to around about 11760. In the here and now, my initial target is 11870. Weaker euro, stronger dollar. So that's what I base my case on in terms of a stronger dollar. The only reason I would reverse that view is if we go back above 12070 and close above it and then head back towards 125. On the basis of this price action alone and the fact that we've taken out these two lows here, my basis for a trade is shifted from buy the dip to sell the rally. And that is important in the context of when you like when you look to time your trades. It's about reacting to the information on the chart and then tailoring your strategy to suit that. So what we've got here is we've got a break of these two lows here. That shifted the consensus from a buy the dip trade to a sell the rally trade. And this is where we currently sit at the moment. So any moves back to here with a stop above here is now the bias towards my analysis and my trade of this particular currency there. So that's euro dollar. Also what it means in the context of euro sterling, last week I talked about euro sterling and I was fairly unequivocal. I said it's going down and it's going down. Um, so really it's a question of where are we going to next? Well ultimately now that we've broken this very key support level here, then really we're, we're really looking back to around about these levels here. So we're talking 86.90, 86.80. Um, for me, the extent of this move, it's fairly unequivocal. The Bank of England shift away from negative rates is positive for the pound. The vaccine trade, positive for the pound. Europe's playing catch up, positive for the pound. There's nothing at the moment, and I caveat that, with at the moment that's going to sway me from my um, belief that euro sterling is heading down. And that's basically what I'll be looking to do, look for opportunities to get a short position on and push this bad boy back down to these lows here. Also, we've got the fact that a stronger dollar, um, while it's likely to limit the upside in cable, when we look at cable, we can see from this chart here that sterling still remains fundamentally strong. Higher lows, higher highs. We're finding a little bit of a difficulty at the 137.50 area, but as long as we hold above 136, or this series of lows through here, then the uptrend for the pound remains intact. The trend is your friend. It's very, very important in the overall context of what we're looking at over the course of the next few days. And also we've seen a similarly positive dollar move in dollar yen. Now, the thing with this move in dollar yen, we've broken above this downtrend move here, but we're now running into the 200 day moving average. That's likely to be a very significant barrier, but overall the momentum in dollar yen has shifted now that we've broken through this series of peaks through here. Now what we can do in terms of looking to buy the dip on dollar yen is just draw a simple line through here and there's our next trend line. So that's dollar yen. Okay, so that's that's a quick pricey of all the major markets that I've got my eyes out for over the course of the next week or so. Now let's look ahead to next week because actually when we look ahead at next week, we've got Chinese New Year starting. Now ordinarily you'd be we'd be looking for Chinese retail sales, China trade and what have you. That doesn't appear to be in the calendar. So I'm not going to preview it because if it's not in the calendar, there's no guarantee that we probably won't see it until March next year. What I will be keeping a close eye on um, in this upcoming week is the latest fourth quarter or the first iteration of UK fourth quarter GDP. Um, and that is going to be fairly instructive, I think, in terms of the overall direction of the UK economy in the overall um, manner as how we look at how the economy performed at the back end of last year. Now, we saw a fairly decent third quarter. We saw an expansion of 16%. In Q4, the economy has been much more troubled. And I think therein, I think 
lies the concern because there's been an awful lot of fog around the UK economy in Q4 because we had stop start restrictions starting in November. Um, so around about the beginning of November, large parts of the economy were locked down into tier two, tier three and tier four. We then had the unlocking at the beginning of December, um, which prompted a little bit of a retail surge in the lead up to Christmas. And then we had the tighter restrictions in the lead up to Christmas. And then obviously we got the lockdown, the full lockdown in January. So I think the problem with Q4 is that there's a good chance that we could well see a negative quarter, but there's an equally good possibility that we could actually see a positive quarter because of stockpiling um, ahead of the Brexit deadline um, and um, concerns about um, concerns about uh, logistics problems at um, UK ports. So the big question for me is, do we see a double dip? Now, uh, you know, a, a recession is categorized by two quarters of negative growth. So Q1 of this year is gonna be negative. There's no doubt about that, simply because the economy has been locked down pretty much from the 6th of January, um, and it's likely to be locked down until pretty much um, the end of March. Um, there may be some loosening of restrictions between now and then the primary schools go back on the 8th of March. But ultimately, Q1, you can write that off. Bank of England have already said at this week's meeting that the UK economy is likely to contract by 4% in Q1. So Q4 is going to be very, very important in the context of whether we double dip. And that's why the manufacturing production and industrial production data will be important. That's also out on Friday. Um, if recent PMIs are any guide, then we could well see a good performance from those sectors in Q4. We already have. The numbers have been fairly decent. Um, the, big, the, the big unknown is obviously the services sector. Um, so in terms of the Q4, we could, see, we could have seen a big jump in imports as retailers and businesses stockpile goods ahead of the Christmas period as well as the end of the Brexit transition period. So that could give Q4 numbers a boost. So we've got a consensus around Q4 GDP of plus to minus 0.5%. It's gonna be in there somewhere, but I think certainly from an optics point of view, a positive number will mean there's no double dip. I mean, obviously furlough um, has cushioned some of the effect in terms of the overall economy, but nonetheless, I think it still will be a very positive headline media story if we actually see a positive number for Q4, which again is likely to act as a lift for Sterling if we manage to avoid a negative, if we have managed to avoid a Q4 contraction. Okay, so Friday data, UK data, fourth quarter GDP, industrial production and manufacturing production for December. Expecting decent gains for both for industrial and manufacturing production and really it's flip a coin as to whether we get a positive or negative quarter for Q4. In terms of anything else, we've obviously got weekly jobless claims out of the US. They've continued to come down um, from the peak that we saw in the beginning of January of 965. They're now below 750,000 and the hope is they will continue to come down as optimism grows about the US economic recovery and US businesses take on more workers. What we do have this week is a whole host of retail earnings and as well as AstraZeneca. Now, AstraZeneca obviously has been in the news an awful lot recently, not necessarily for the right reasons. Obviously, there's, AstraZeneca has um, got an awful lot of headlines as a result of the EU and um, its threats to sanction the company over the fact that um, it has is having to upgrade its plants in the European Union to um, upscale its uh, vaccine production program. So we've got the latest four year numbers from AstraZeneca coming up. Certainly we can see it's probably one of the most boring stocks imaginable in terms of price action, but ultimately it is towards the lower end of its recent range. And that would suggest to me that as long as the four year revenues come in 
as expected at around about $26.4 billion, then we're probably going to see AstraZeneca go for a nice little trip back towards the 8,000 level on this particular chart. Didn't want to do that. There we go. Back to where we were. We also have numbers from Twitter, uh, Q, Q4 numbers from Twitter on the 9th of Feb. We have Disney, um, first quarter numbers from Disney on the 11th of Feb. We've also got um, first half numbers from Dunelm. And Dunelm has been one of those um, success stories of the pandemic. Uh, managed to ride out the, um, has managed to ride out the peaks and troughs fairly well, despite the various store closures that we've seen as a result of the various lockdowns. Managed to recover all its share price losses from March last year fairly quickly. We can see that from this chart. He has given back a little bit in the past few weeks, but nonetheless, it's finding a nice little base in and around this 1140 area. So certainly if we do get a dip in Dunelm share price, um, might be worth might be worth a smaller, small little, small little punt down here. Um, we also have full year numbers from Ocado. Um, that's likely to be um, an eye opener for the one reason that it just continues to go from strength to strength. It's it's actually mind boggling when I look at and talk about Ocado because for me. It's not so much a retailer as a technology provider. The companies deal with the M&S and has done very, very well. And yet it's valued nearly as big as Tesco's. Um, Tesco's is the UK's number one supermarket. It's got a market capitalization of 26 billion pounds. Ocado is valued at 20 billion pounds. And yet its retail revenue doesn't even get close to a billion and Tesco turns over 60 times that. So the big question for me is not so much as to whether or not we can actually go any higher on Ocado, it's whether or not it can meet the it can meet the elevated expectations that shareholders are um, setting it against. It's certainly, it's certainly seeing some significant growth in terms of retail revenues. It's just signed two deals for combined 287 million with some robotics manufacturers so that it can improve its supply chain and its picking capability. Um, but overall, when I look at Ocado, I just <laughs> I just can't get over the fact that um, you know it's um, slightly frothy, shall we say? But nonetheless, as I've said on previous um, instances, the trend is your friend on this one. It's still it's still very much in an uptrend. Has been pretty much for the whole of 2020 and this year alone. And if we take out these peaks here, then we could well see further gains through this 3000 level through here. Um, one thing that I will keep an eye out for and uh, draw your attention to is the Uber numbers as well. We've got them um, out as well as Disney. So I'll cover Uber and I'll cover Disney for you right now. I'll just open Disney for you. There we go. And while I'm there, I'll open the Uber chart. Now, I've got to say that with respect to Disney or the mouse house, as people like to call it, and the markets have been a little bit disappointed in the, um, not just a little bit surprised in the share price performance. Not disappointed, surprised in the share price performance. Disney Plus certainly has been ripping up trees. Still got high hopes of competing with Netflix and Amazon Prime. And they are now looking to raise their prices. UK subscriptions are going up to $7.99 a month in March. Still cheaper than Netflix. Um, but ultimately, I think there have been some missteps when it comes to um, rolling out its new content. Charging $30 to view Mulan, I think was a little presumptuous, fell a bit flat. Um, nonetheless, it's shed 32,000 jobs in its theme park resorts, its holidays, um, and what have you. 
but that doesn't change the fact that losses for this quarter are expected to come in at around about a billion dollars. Um, and that's more than what we saw in the previous quarter, where it lost $710 million. So certainly at the moment, its key revenue earners are hitting its bottom line quite significantly. There is an awful lot of high expectations with respect to what these numbers are likely to bring about. Um, and that might suggest that maybe this particular share price at the moment is a little bit frothy and may well see a little bit of selling pressure, particularly if it's Disney Plus numbers start to show any signs of topping out. Uber, again, another cash burner for you. Again, I can't believe that it's valued as high as it is, but yeah, we are, it is. Um, even without the pandemic, and it's ride hailing, that's been suffering as a result. People aren't taking cabs, they're not traveling anywhere. It's Uber Eats business is doing very, very well, but the revenues that it derives from that are a fraction of its overall turnover. So again, it is diversing, it's, it, it, is, it is diversing, diversifying its uh, Eats business. Paid $1 billion for alcohol delivery company Drizzly. So it can widen its delivery mix from restaurant food, you can pick up a bottle of wine, put it to your doorstep, yada, yada, yada. Even so, losses are still expected to come in in and around a billion, two billion dollars for the quarter. So again, ask yourself the question whether or not it's worth a little bit of a sell-off if it can't get through this $60 a share mark. Anyway, that's um, pretty much it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Um, until next week, in the meantime, thank you very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Market.